they say that Ra, when he became aware of Newt's intercourse with Geb, invoked a curse upon her that she should not give birth to a child in any month or year. But Tolf, being enamoured of a goddess, consorted with her. Later, playing at draughts with the moon, he won from her the 70th part of each of her periods of illumination. And from all the winnings, he composed five days and intercalated them as an addition to the 360 days. The Egyptians even now call these five days intercalated and celebrate them as the birthdays of the gods. They relate that on the first of these days, Osiris was born, and that the hour of his birth, a voice issued forth, saying, The Lord of all advances into the light. On the second of these days, Horus was born, and some call him also the Elder Horus. On the third day, Set was born, but not in due season or manner. But with a blow he broke out through his mother's side and leapt forth. On the fourth day, Isis was born, in the regions that are ever moist. And on the fifth day, Nephthys, to whom they give the name Finality, and some also the name Victory. They relate, moreover, that Nephthys became the wife of Set, but Isis and Osiris were enamoured of each other and consorted together in the darkness of a womb before their birth. One of the first acts related of Osiris in his reign was to deliver the Egyptians from their destitute and brutish manner of living. This he did by showing them the fruits of cultivation, by giving them laws and by teaching them to honour the gods. Later, he travelled over the whole earth, civilising it without the slightest need of arms. But most of the peoples he won over to his way by the charm of his persuasive discourse combined with song and all manner of music. During his absence, the tradition is that Set attempted nothing revolutionary because Isis, who was in control, was vigilant and alert. But when he returned home, Set contrived a treacherous plot against him and formed a group of conspirators, 72 in number. He had also the cooperation of a queen from Ethiopia, who was there at the time, and whose name they report as Asso. Set, having secretly measured Osiris's body and having made ready a beautiful chest of corresponding size artistically ornamented, caused it to be brought into the room where the festivity was in progress. The company was much pleased with the sight of it and admired it greatly, whereupon Set jestingly promised to present it to the man who should find the chest to be exactly his length when they lay down in it. They all tried it in turn, but no one fitted it. Then Osiris got into it and lay down, and those who were in on the plot ran to it and slammed down the lid, which they fastened by nails from the outside, and also by using molten lead. Then they carried the chest to the river and sent it on its way to the sea, through the titanic mouth. They say also that the date on which this deed was done was the seventeenth day of Hathor, when the sun passed through Scorpio, and in the 28th year of the reign of Osiris. But some say that these are the years of his life and not his reign. They relate also that Isis, learning that Osiris in his love had consorted with her sister through ignorance, in the belief that she was Isis, and seeing the proof of this in the garland of Melilot, which he had left with Nephthys, sought to find the child, for the mother immediately after its birth had exposed it because of her fear of Set. And when the child had been found, after great toil and trouble, with the help of dogs which led Isis to it, 
it was brought up and became her guardian and attendant, receiving the name Anubis, and it is said to protect the gods just as dogs protect men. Thereafter, Isis, as they relate, learned that the chest had been cast up by the sea near the land of Byblos, and that the waves had gently set it down in the midst of a clump of heather. The heather, in a short time, ran up into a very beautiful and massive stock and enfolded and embraced the chest with its growth and concealed it within its trunk. The king of the country admired the great size of the plant and cut off the portion that enfolded the chest and used it as a pillar to support the roof of his house. Then the goddess disclosed herself and asked for the pillar, which served to support the roof. She removed it with the greatest ease and cut away the wood of heather which surrounded the chest. Then when she wrapped up the wood in a linen cloth and had poured perfume upon it, she entrusted it to the care of the kings. And even to this day, the people of Byblos venerate this wood, which is preserved in the shrine of Isis. As they relate, Isis proceeded to her son Horus, who was being reared in Buto, and bestowed the chest in a place well out of the way. But Set, who was hunting by the night in the light of the moon, happened upon it. Recognising the body, he divided it into fourteen parts and scattered them, each in a different place. Isis learned of this and sought for them again, sailing through the swamps in a boat of papyrus. The traditional result of Osiris's dismemberment is that there are many so-called tombs of Osiris in Egypt. For Isis held a funeral for each part when she had found it. Others deny this and assert that she caused effigies of him to be made and these she distributed among the several cities, pretending that she was giving them his body in order that he might receive divine honours in a greater number of cities and also that if Set should succeed in overpowering Horus, he might despair of ever finding the true tomb when so many were pointed out to him. All of them called the tomb of Osiris. Of the parts of Osiris's body, the only one which Isis did not find was the male member. For the reason that this had been at once tossed into the river, and the Lepidotus, and the sea bream, and the pike had fed upon it. And it is from these very fishes the Egyptians are most scrupulous in abstaining. But Isis made a replica of a member to take its place and consecrated the phallus in honor of which the Egyptians even at the present day celebrate a festival. Later, as they relate, Osiris came to Horus from the other world and exercised and trained him for the battle. Now the battle, as they relate, lasted many days and Horus prevailed. Set formally accused Horus of being an illegitimate child, but with the help of Toph to plead his case, it was decided by the gods that he also was legitimate. Set was then overcome in two other battles. Stories akin to these and to others like them they say are related about Set, how that, prompted by jealousy and hostility, he wrought terrible deeds and by bringing utter confusion upon all things, filled the whole earth and the ocean as well with ills and later paid the penalty therefore. The Egyptians, because of their belief that Set was of a red complexion, also dedicate to sacrifice such of their neat cattle as are of a red colour, but they conduct the examination of these so scrupulously that if an animal has but one hair, black or white, they think it is wrong to sacrifice it, for they regard as suitable for sacrifice not what is dear to the gods, 
but the reverse, namely such animals as have incarnate in them souls of unholy and unrighteous men who have been transformed into other bodies. And thus among the Egyptians, such men say that Osiris is for now consorting with the earth, which is Isis, and that the sea is set, into which for now discharges its waters and is lost to view and dissipated, save for that part which the earth takes up and absorbs and thereby becomes fertilized. But the wiser of the priests call not only the Nile Osiris and the sea set, but they simply give the name of Osiris to the whole source of faculty creative of moisture, believing this to be the cause of generation and the substance of life-producing seed. And the name of set they give to all that is dry, fiery and arid, in general and antagonistic to moisture. Therefore, because they believe that he was personally of a reddish sallow colour, they are not eager to meet men of such complexion, nor do they like to associate with them. Osiris, on the other hand, according to their legendary tradition, was dark because water darkens everything, earth and clothes and clouds, when it comes into contact with them. Not only the now, but every form of moisture they call simply the effusion of Osiris. And in their holy rites, the water jar, in honour of the god, head the procession. As they regard the now as the effusion of Osiris, so they hold and believe the earth to be the body of Isis. Not all of it, but so much of it as the now covers, fertilising it and uniting with it. From this union, they make Horus to be born. The outmost parts of the land, beside the mountains and bordering on the sea, the Egyptians call Nephis. This is why they give to Nephis the name of Finality and say that she is the wife of Set. Whenever then, the Nile overflows and with abounding waters spreads far away to those who dwell in the outermost regions, they call this the union of Osiris with Nephis, which is proved by the upspringing of the plants. Among these is the Melilotus, by the wilting and failing of which, as the story goes, Set gained knowledge of a wrong done to his bed. So Isis gave birth to Horus in lawful wedlock, but Nephis bore Anubis, Chandestanli. However, in the chronological list of the kings, they record that Nephis, after her marriage to Set, was at first barren. If they say this not about a woman, but about a goddess, they must mean by it for utter barrenness and unproductivity of the earth resulting from a hard-baked soil. The insidious scheming and usurpation of Set then is the power of drought, which gains control and dissipates the moisture, which is the source of the now and of its rising, and his coadjutor, the queen of the Ethiopians, signifies allegorically the south winds from Ethiopia. For whenever these gain the upper hand over the northerly, over Etisian winds, which drive the clouds towards Ethiopia, and when they prevent the falling of the rains, which cause the rising of the now, then Set, being in possession, blazes with scorching heat, and having gained complete mastery, he forces the now in retreat to draw back its waters for weakness, and flowing at the bottom of its almost empty channel to proceed to the sea. The story told of the shutting up of Osiris in the chest seems to mean nothing else than the vanishing and disappearance of water. Consequently, they say that the disappearance of Osiris occurred in the month of Hathor, at the time when, owing to the complete cessation of the Etesian winds, the Nile recedes to its low level and the land becomes denuded. But the Egyptians, 
by combining with these physical explanations some of the scientific results derived from astronomy think that by set is meant the solar world and by Osiris the lunar world. They reason that the moon, because it has light that is generative and productive of moisture, is kindly towards the young of animals and the burgeoning plants, whereas the sun, by its untempered and pitiless heat, makes all growing and flourishing vegetation hot and parched, and though its blazing light renders a large part of the earth uninhabitable, and in many, a region overpowers the moon. In fact, the actions of the moon are like actions of reason and perfect wisdom, whereas those of the sun are like beatings administered through violence and brute strength. Some say that the years of Osiris' life Others, that the years of his reign were 28, for that is the number of the moon's illuminations, and in that number of days does she complete her cycle. The dismemberment of Osiris into 14 parts, they refer allegorically to the days of the waning of that satellite from the time of a full moon to the new moon. The Apis, they say, is the animate image of Osiris and he comes into being when a fructifying light thrusts forth from the moon and falls upon a cow in her breeding season. Wherefore, there are many things in the Apis that resemble features of the moon, his bright parts being darkened by the shadowy. Moreover, at the time of the new moon in the month of Feminoth, they celebrate a festival to which they give the name of Osiris' coming to the moon, and this marks the beginning of spring. Thus they make the power of Osiris to be fixed in the moon, and say that Isis, since she is generation, is associated with him. There are some who give the name of Set to the earth's shadow, into which they believe the moon slips when it suffers eclipse. Hence it is not unreasonable to say that the statement of each person individually is not right, but that the statement of all collectively is right. For it is not drought, nor wind, nor sea, nor darkness, but everything harmful and destructive that the nature contains, which is to be set down as a part of set. The fact is that the creation and constitution of this world is complex resulting, as it does, from opposing influences, which, however, are not of equal strength, but the predominance rests with the better. Yet it is impossible for the bad to be completely eradicated, since it is innate in large amount, in the body, and likewise in the soul of the universe, and is always fighting hard to fight against the better. So in the soul intelligence and reason, the ruler and lord of all that is good is Osiris, and in earth and wind and water and the heavens and stars, that which is ordered, established and healthy, as evidenced by season, temperatures and cycles of revolution, is the efflux of Osiris and his reflected image. But set is the part of a soul which is impressionable, impulsive, irrational, truculent, and of a bodily part, the destructible, diseased, and disorderly, as evidenced by the abnormal seasons and temperatures, and by obscurations of the sun and disappearances of the moon, outbursts, as it were, and unruly actions on the part of Set.